Welcome to another NFIB Teletown Hall. I'm your host, Kevin Shivers, Executive Director of NFIB here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we want to thank our member event sponsors uh, for uh, these types of activities, AT&T, Capital Blue Cross, and Lilly. Well, as all of you know, natural gas development in Pennsylvania is uh, the latest boom uh, affecting the Commonwealth's economy. More energy uh, lies under Pennsylvania in the form of uh, gas than all of the energy under Saudi Arabia in the form of oil. Uh, but to reap that economic benefit, how do you get that energy from the gas fields to the market? And that's our topic today. Uh, if you have a question uh, for our call, uh, press star three. Um, we're talking about the Transco pipeline. It's been transporting uh, natural gas uh, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico to the East Coast for over 50 years. Um, there's going to be a new project to uh, build that pipeline that will actually take gas from the Marcellus Shale natural gas fields uh, to market. And joining us on this call is Cindy Ivey uh, with the Williams uh, Company. Cindy, uh, thanks for joining our call. Thank you for having me. Well, Cindy, uh, Williams has been involved with the Transco Pipeline for a lot of years, uh, and you're the project leader uh, for this particular effort. Um, and as uh, we get started with the call, I want to actually throw out a question to our listeners. And if you could, um, we have a, a member poll, uh, and the first question we want to ask all of our members that are listening in is, do you think energy infrastructure projects are important to Pennsylvania? If you think energy projects are important uh, and you want to say yes, press Press 1. Uh, if you don't believe these projects are important to Pennsylvania, press uh, number 2 for no. Uh, so if you could take a moment to do that now, and we're going to track the results. Well, as we're continuing on with uh, getting the information from our members on this, uh, uh, Cindy, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what is Transco, uh, you know, who is Transco, and what's the purpose of this project? Well, Transco is the largest natural gas pipeline system in the United States. It's owned by Williams, but Williams is not actually the largest energy company, but Transco, the system itself, is the largest natural gas system in the United States, and it traverses the whole eastern seaboard going from <clears throat> the Gulf of Mexico to New York City, and that's the way it was originally built, one line 1,500 miles from the Gulf to New York City. Over time, the system has expanded to over 10,000 miles of pipe, uh, and now also includes what we call our lighting line in Pennsylvania that was originally built to take storage to and from uh, the lighty storage area. <clears throat> Over time, that line has, we didn't know it at the time, obviously, but at the time, and now it is positioned directly in the Marcellus producing region. So we have a lot of producers wanting to connect into Transco, and this particular system would basically turn Transco around. So it was originally flowing from south to north. This is the third project we've undertaken that will actually turn Transco around and allow Marcellus gas to flow from the Marcellus region south along the eastern seaboard, opening up access to markets that the Marcellus has never had before. So that's really the purpose and need for the project is to take produce it, uh, production from northeast Pennsylvania and Susquehanna County, as well as Clinton and Lycoming counties, and bring it down into the main line in Transco and have access to the eastern seaboard. Well, just a reminder to our members, if you have questions for Cindy Ivey uh, about this uh, Transco project, you can press star three. Uh, you'll be connected uh, with one of our uh, member representatives, and uh, we'll get you in on the call. Uh, again, this is a NFIB Teletown Hall. We're talking about this new Transco natural gas pipeline under uh, proposal uh, here in Pennsylvania. There are, Cindy, uh, how many counties that are affected uh, by this particular pipeline? There are eight Greenfield counties, and one of them's not actually Greenfield because we do have, um, actually two of them are not Greenfield because we actually have infrastructure there. But it will go from, the Greenfield portion will go from Susquehanna to Wyoming to um, Columbia, uh, Northumberland, Schuylkill, Lebanon, and Lancaster, and uh, Luzerne, I forgot Luzerne in there. So Luzerne and Lancaster, we already actually have uh, existing infrastructure in those two counties. 
Well, uh, yeah, you know, in a minute I want to talk about the economic uh, benefits, but I did want to get back and share the results of our listener poll. Uh, 97% of N- NFIB members, Cindy, uh, have told us that they think energy infrastructure projects are important to Pennsylvania. That's a pretty significant number of, of our members as a percentage who believe that this is, uh, this is important to Pennsylvania. But maybe you could explain uh, to all of those uh, members listening in on this call, what are the economic benefits, uh, not only to Pennsylvania for this project, but specifically to the counties and to the businesses and and residents in the communities in the project area. Right. So there's really a twofold part. We commissioned Penn State to do a study, an economic impact study for us. We supply the raw data of what we anticipate, number of miles, amount of pipe, number of workers that it would take to build a project like this, which is about 182 miles of Greenfield Pipeline, which is the largest expansion that Transco has ever undertaken. And according to Penn State, the Atlantic Sunrise Project would support about 8,000 jobs, Um, about $870 million in economic value, and about um, 1.9 million in annual economic impact that would support about 29 jobs. Now that part, the last part was really the ongoing operations for it. So you have sort of the construction that brings in a pretty big boom uh, of folks coming in to, uh, to do that. We hire locally as much as possible. We use local products and services as much as possible. But because we have very, very strict operator qualifications for actual work on the pipeline itself, there are some very highly specialized construction workers that we have to bring into the area. The other part of the study is basically estimating what the impact would be on the project outside. So when what happens when Marcellus Gas leaves the Commonwealth um, and actually serves some of those other markets on the eastern seaboard? Again, probably not as important to your members except for the fact that it is important to get Marcellus to all markets. And um, our researchers estimated about um, the, the Mid-Atlantic regions could have saved about $2.6 billion dollars from 2012 to 2014 due to increased access to the lower price Pennsylvania gas in the Marcellus. Well, uh, thank you very much, Cindy. And again, a note to our members, if you have any questions, press star three. Um, talking about the uh, economic benefits of uh, the uh, Transco pipeline project that's extending uh, through about 10 counties here in north uh, central and south central Pennsylvania. Obviously, there are some questions, uh, concerns, and and, and issues uh, that our members might be um, interested in regarding uh, land use, the environment, and just, you know, what are the impacts uh, here locally. If you have questions, again, press star three. You'll be connected into the call. Um, Cindy, there are literally thousands of miles of pipeline that have been running all over Pennsylvania already. Uh, what's the difference between um, you know, this particular project and, and those other existing pipelines? Right. Well, you could probably think of it similar to a highway system. The Transco line is sort of the superhighway and gathering lines and lines that leave the wellhead uh, in the producing areas. Those are sort of your feeder roads. They're sort of on-ramps and off-ramps to the highway. Transco would be basically the major superhighway, and these other transmission, uh, these other uh, transportation lines would feed into – it's really a big grid. Just like the electric system has a big grid, so does the natural gas system across the United States. Transco being, like I said, the largest system. So basically they have different, they're usually different sizes in diameter, usually different pressures. They have different regulatory processes that they must go through. So even though a pipeline might look like a pipeline, whether it's a midstream pipeline, a gathering pipeline, uh, a feeder line that takes the gas from the wellhead, like I said, all different regulatory processes different diameters, different pressures, and Transco's line and natural gas, interstate natural gas pipeline across the nation are really those super highways that carry that gas to market. We're not business to consumer. We're business to business. So our customers are shippers coming in from the producing areas, as well as large industrial customers like power plants, and then also local distribution companies similar to um, uh, UGI in in the southern part uh, and other uh, local utilities throughout Pennsylvania. Those are our major customers. Excellent. Cindy, uh, would would you mind taking a call from uh, some of our members? Sure. 
Fantastic. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Glenn uh, here in a moment. Uh, Glenn, uh, uh, what's your question? Hello, Glenn. Uh, what's your question? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Effort of Pennsylvania. My question was, how is this the safety of natural gas compared to other petroleum products as far as transportation-wise? Right. Well, natural gas and pipelines are the safest form of any kind of energy transportation, liquids or natural gas. The thing about natural gas that's different from liquids is in the unlikely event that an incident did occur, uh, methane is what natural gas is, 99% methane, that actually goes up into the atmosphere and is dissipated very, very quickly. If you have a leak at a liquids line, basically what happens is that's heavier than air and will seep into the ground. Uh, groundwater, those kinds of things. So different uh, just properties of the, of, the, of the energy that's traveling through the pipeline. Uh, for Transco, we are rigorously um, regulated by the Code of Federal Regulations. It's basically a part of DOT called PHMSA. It's the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, and they have certain guidelines and rules that we must follow. There are uh, any number of safety factors that are built into a pipeline like Atlantic Sunrise, um, having to do with cathodic protection to protect the, the life and the health of the, pop, uh, of the pipeline, the way we test the pipeline for the health. We use a, uh, a, an internal inspection tool called Smart Pigs. But even before the pi pipeline is put into service, we start with our inspectors at the pipe mill. We choose the grade of steel that we want to use. We have very rigorous um, uh, standards for what that grade of steel is, who builds the pipeline for us. We have inspectors at the mill. They test it at the mill. They code it at the mill. Coding is also a very, very impor important part of our system. And uh, then, so it goes really from cradle to grave. I mean, as soon as the, as soon as the um, pipeline is rolled at the pipe mill, to the time it's installed, we have inspectors and safety and uh, all kinds of things going on, as well as making sure that our contractors, again, are highly qualified to build these very specialized pipelines. Great question, Glenn. You're listening to an NFIB Teletown Hall uh, meeting. I'm your host, Kevin Shivers, Executive Director of NFIB here in Pennsylvania. We're discussing with Cindy Ivey from the Williams Company natural gas development here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Cindy is the project leader uh, for an outreach effort uh, dealing with the uh, uh, new uh, Atlant Sunrise, Atlantic Sunrise Project, a development of a natural gas pipeline from the uh, Marcellus Shale Fields uh, out to market, running through through uh, North and South Central Pennsylvania. If you have questions for Cindy uh, or for NFIB, you can press star three uh, and we'll connect you in with the call. Uh, Cindy, um, this particular project, you're the team leader for the outreach effort. Uh, I'm sure that's probably part of the, the permitting process that you're going through. Could you maybe explain a little bit about what your goals, what your objectives are in this phase of the project? Sure. When we start a project like this from, from the very basic inception, our goal is, doesn't always work exactly like this, but our goal is that every community should hear about the plans of the company before a newspaper article or any of those kinds of things. And we go to local officials, county officials, and we do a lot of outreach before the project has even hit the regulatory process. And basically the reason we do that is because in many areas we don't have existing infrastructure, so we have to ask for permission from landowners if we can look at their land, survey their land, understand the land use uh, of their particular land, so the local officials are contacted first, and then the landowners are contacted, and then we start a process of dialogue, both with the company at the local official level, uh, the state level, the federal level, and with a, a big team of land agents with the landowners. You know, where are your septic systems? Where are your wells? Um, you know, any number of things. How does your how is your land used? Is it timber? Is it ag? Um, and and we go through a very 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 exhaustive process of listening. So the first part of the regulatory 
inventory process is called pre-filing, which means it's prior to the filing of an actual application. And the whole point of that, we were in that process for about 11 months. And the whole process, the whole reason behind that process is to listen. And as a result of basically listening to all the stakeholders, and that's to agencies, our permitting agencies, it's to landowners, it's to local officials, about 47% of the route has changed since the beginning of when we first did a, a really basic construction, you know, sort of looking at a corridor, a study corridor to see where things might be located, what makes a good place for a natural gas pipeline because there are infinite numbers of ways to get from point A to point B. So part of that developing of that study corridor is listening and then being able to respond to concerns if possible. We have to take our safety. We have to take our ongoing operations. We have to take construction methodologies into account. But we try to be as flexible as we can. And as a result, we've changed about 47% of the route. And that's due to directly from outreach to um, all of the stakeholders in the project area. Let, let's talk a little bit more about that that survey process, the survey permission process. I mean, what types of surveys are you conducting, and then you know how how are you using this information? Basically, what we need to do is one look from a civil perspective. Civil survey is this study corridor? Is this a constructible route? Can the equipment travel safely over it? Uh, can the pipeline be safely installed in this particular area? You know, what would the impacts be? And then our civil folks go with our routing engineers who are also looking from an engineering hat. And then we also go with environmentalists who are looking for environmentally sensitive areas, threatened and endangered species, native habitats, uh, stream crossings, wetlands, water bodies. So there are any number of data points that must go into our formal application because our formal application has to be reviewed using the NEPA process, which is the National Environmental Policy Act process. And our federal regulator, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uses the NEPA process to examine and study and do their own research on any type of uh, expansion of an, an existing natural gas pipeline system like Transco. If you have any questions uh, for Cindy about this uh, Atlantic Sunrise project, again, press star three. Uh, you'll be connected to the call. Uh, Cindy, how does a landowner find out that their land is uh, now uh, on uh, this uh, uh, in this proposed project? Well, as I mentioned, we've been working for over a year trying to um, identify this study corridor and work within it, try to find out the different land uses and environmental um, uh, sensitive areas that might be part of that particular study corridor. So basically when we start, we contact a lot more landowners. So an, an eventual right-of-way will be 50 feet wide, but we start with a, a study corridor of about 600 feet wide, and we contact quite a few owners. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of people that are interested in the project from the very beginning because we're looking at a pretty wide swath to try to see if we can wiggle our way through, be fle flexible with different landowners and have the room to basically be flexible. So we contact a lot of folks and then we start working and working and working and engineering and designing and then we finally end up with basically a line list that would be what we would call our construction corridor which is much smaller than um, at the study corridor. So we have a study corridor first at about 600. We have a survey corridor of about 300 feet wide. We have a construction corridor that's anywhere from, it could be as small as 75 feet in a very, very um, tight stream or water body area to 125 feet or so in an agricultural area where we might have to, where we would definitely uh, segregate topsoil, but might have to do a single ditch, a triple ditch, a double ditch, just, just to make sure that we're understanding the different layers of soil and having uh, room to store that sto soil and then be able to put it back in the trench exactly the way it came out. So that, that's kind of the, the width and that's the landowners. So basically it's a process of a conversation with a company that's ongoing and keeps going until we have determined what we feel like is our best primary route that we actually file our application uh, with, which we did on March 31st. And so, I mean, the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, th these these are landowners that are not just being notified right before the, you know, the shovels come in. You know, this is at the preliminary start of the process, correct? Oh, uh, absolutely. You're just trying to learn about the, the land and, and its current existing use. 
Yes, yes. And or the okay. highest and best use. Say it's a preserved farm or say it's a, a farm that a family has sold the development rights to. If there's going to be a subdivision there, then we want to make sure we understand where the lots are, how they've drawn it, and we understand sort of their future plans because we're a pipeline is in the ground for a long time and we need to understand what the current use as well as what could be the future use of that land. Okay, we're going to take a call here from Vicki. Uh, Vicki, if you could tell us where you're calling from and what your question is. Susquehanna County, Middletown Township. We're dairy farmers. And we're in the process of a pipeline right now. We haven't signed, but anyway, several thousand feet. My question is, we're going to sign maybe for, say, two pipelines to be put in when they come. How do you connect on? Do you come back in here and want to put another pipeline in, or does it connect somewhere on down the road? We're at the end of Susquehanna County. Right. Um, well, there's a diff- there's a, that's kind of a multi-layered question you probably didn't know you were yeah. asking. So yeah. when so a project like Atlantic Sunrise, and again, I'm not sure which company you're dealing with, but a project like Ex- Atlantic Sunrise, we're looking to purchase the easement rights for one pipeline to construct, operate, and maintain one line. There are other companies, Williams included at times, where they will try to purchase multiple line Mm -hmm. rights. And they will pay you basically for the ability to come back in and add another line. They, depending on the regulatory process that they would have to go through, kind of determines the method by which they would come back to you if you were going to sell multiple line rights. For Atlantic Sunrise, we're only buying a single line right to construct, operate, and maintain. Okay, so you're looking at one single. You're right, one they single. want to put multiple, but I think we'll stick to two, and then uh, if they want more, they got to come back. Exactly. Uh, okay. They would have to negotiate with you again for any additional line. So you can truly negotiate for one, two, multiple. You know, in mm-hmm. the early, early days of Transco, we had what was called open and undefined easements. And so that was before we really even knew what kind of was going to happen in the sort of whole, in, whole country in, energy infrastructure build. But um, so some of our old easements are still open and undefined. But typically when Transco goes out for a, for a project like this, we buy the rights to construct, operate, and maintain one line. If we want to add additional lines, we will come back and buy the rights again for an additional line. I want to go to another poll question that we pose to uh, our members, and that is, uh, in your opinion, um, the, what's the most important issue in your mind about this particular project? Uh, if you believe that the economic benefits for your area are the most important, press one. Uh, if you believe getting Marcellus gas uh, to the market uh, is the most important, press two. If uh, you believe the environmental impacts uh, in, in land use are the most important, press uh, three. Uh, so uh, start your voting now. Uh, and with that, we are going to go to Kathy. Uh, Kathy uh, you're on the call. What's your question? Oh, hi. Good. Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. Um, I work for a foundry in Western Pennsylvania, so um, I'd just like to know how you envision this new pipeline uh, will eventually impact the price of natural gas for high end users here in PA. And will the pipeline be mainly used to transport these the energy, the gas, out of state to other regions, or um, you know how might it reduce transport costs? for users within PA as well. And uh, we're a high-end user, as I, as I mentioned, you know, here in Western PA. So the cost of energy really factors into um, sure. uh, the cost of our product in a very major of way. Course. So of it's, course. Uh, it's an, you know, this is an, an area we're watching very closely, and uh, it's of great interest to us. And um, I wanted to know what the time frame you have uh, for the, the you envision. I guess I know obviously it's hard to calculate. It's a lot of work that needs to go into this. But uh, what's the time frame you're looking at for the pipeline to um, to be um, enacted? And then also um, how far west are you going with the pipeline? Okay. So let me take the timeline first. We just filed our application. We hope to have... Um, there's several parts that have to come through, some milestones. They have to do an envir- FERC has to do an environmental impact statement. We hope the environmental a draft of that will come in September. 
of 2015. We hope the final environmental impact statement would come in February of 16, and we hope that we would get an order by May or so of 16 and be able to start construction in July of 2016. For a project of this size, we have two compressor stations as well. It takes uh, about a year. That doesn't mean in any one area we're there for that long, but I'm just talking about construction duration for the entire project would be about a year, so we hope to be in service around July of 2017. To your answer about cost, I can, I can answer it in theory more on the transportation side than I can on sort of the commercial transaction that happens between the shipper and the end user. We're sort of the straw or the conduit that goes between that. We're just like a trucking company. We get paid by hauling the gas from point A to point B, but we don't actually own the gas. From a transportation perspective, it makes perfect sense that if additional infrastructure is close to you or is in your area, then you're going to be paying less transportation to go from a supply area to where you're, you might take your particular gas. If you take it directly from uh, a, tra a line like Transco, a very large industrial users do that occasionally. Um, but other, uh, you might also have like an intermediary uh, local distribution that acts as that third party taking it from the Transco line to an end user like your particular company. It stands to reason that if the gas, the molecule of gas is traveling certainly a lot less distance than from the Gulf of Mexico, if it's coming Coming to you from the Marcellus, then it's going. The transportation costs are going to be drastically reduced, and I can give you some examples about sort of what happened last winter. Not this one that we just finished, but the one before that was just so amazingly cold. If if people in the Northeast, I'm going to say in the New England area, if they had had access to Marcellus gas, but they don't right now because they don't have the infrastructure to connect the Marcellus to, I'm going to say, Boston, New York, New England, that particular area, they paid about $100 for MCF of their gas it would have been $4 basically if they'd been able to have access to the Marcellus. So end users like that, that's just an example of what happens when a piece of infrastructure comes in and makes all the parts of the energy value chain from the producer to the midstream folks to the transportation to the end user, that's what happens when the chain is connected in a certain area. I can't really say exactly what it would do to your prices, but I can say that the conditions would exist to greatly help your energy costs. Cindy, can you stay with us about five more minutes uh, and maybe answer some more questions from our members? Sure. Fantastic. Again, press star three uh, if you have a, a question for Cindy about this Atlantic Sunrise uh, project, this natural gas pipeline through South North and South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, also, uh, if we can't get to your question, uh, if you stay on the line at the end of the call, you can leave that information. You'll be getting instructions. So if you ask a question, we'll make sure that uh, uh, Cindy gets back to you about the project. Um, Cindy, I wanted to talk to you about the results that came in uh, most recently in this this, this latest survey about what are the most important issues in your mind about Perfect. the project. Uh, about 55% uh, of members believe that, you know, again, land use environmental impacts are the most important. Um, about 36% of our members believe that uh, getting Marcellus to market uh, is important as well. So if we could maybe just take on the, the, the land use, the, the environmental issue, uh, and maybe talk about, you know, why should landowners grant survey permissions, uh, you know, when, when you reach out to them about this project? Sure. Uh, the important part about survey permission is that the company is can be much more flexible when they're actually able to get boots on the ground and see how the land is used. When we start looking at a project like this, we're looking, our engineers are back in the office, they're looking at Bing Photography, Google Earth, and they're looking only for constructability, they're looking for topography. They can't really tell a lot from a desktop point of view what the actual land use or what what the highest and best use for, of a particular landowner's property is. We don't route with township lines. We don't route with county lines. We are really looking in the very beginning on what we feel like would be an excellent route for the safe and reliable operation of a natural gas pipeline system. Then we start talking to folks and then we layer on other data like environmental, like uh, geo. Um, 
geology type things, uh, environmental, uh, water resources, and those are sort of GIS layers that we start layering on to understand more about the land use. But until we actually get boots on the ground, we don't exactly know from an individual perspective how that land is used. So those conversations very early in the process by allowing our engineers to come on the process and understand, are you building additional dairy barns? Are you planning on putting in additional manure storage? How are you going to be using? Are there other outbuildings that you feel like you would want uh, down the road? Then tell us about it. But you, those are things that you can't tell from a desktop point of view. So talking to company representatives is very important, and we can be a lot more flexible if we understand what's going on than maybe the, your surrounding landowners or neighbors talking to us, and maybe the middle landowner doesn't. The middle landowner doesn't get the benefit of maybe some of the other uh, uh, adjustments or flexibility that were added to the neighbors. And basically what happens then, we just draw a straight line across that property rather than understanding, again, what we could do. And again, we're never going to be able to please every landowner, but we certainly want the opportunity to be able to talk to see if the company can be flexible. And that's, again, that's reflected in the 47% that we've made changes over the last 11 months. And now what, what kinds of easements are you buying and, and how wide are they? I mean, when we're talking about land use here, I mean, can you give us a little bit of a, a scope of the, the size of, of the project right. and the use right. of the property? Uh -huh. At the very end, the easement will be 50 feet wide, depending on if you're in the northern county, Susquehanna, Wyoming, Luzerne. Uh, those, that's a 30-inch line that's going in there. The southern part of the project would be a 42-inch line, but the easement would be the same, 50 feet. The construction corridor, as I said, could vary from 100 to 125 feet, depending, again, on the land use. So the 50-foot would be permanent, and the 125, so the additional outside the 50, would be temporary impacts. Those will be restored back to, uh, all of it will be restored, but certainly that temporary workspace can go back uh, to the way it was originally used. Uh, and then the 50 feet does have some restrictions. Uh, we do buy the rights to construct, operate, and maintain. We do not buy the land in fee. The landowner retains the fee ownership of the land. Um, but you can farm over an easement. The main thing that you can't do over the easement is, one, build a structure, or two, uh, build very large trees because the tree roots could damage the protective coating on the outside of the pipeline. And we monitor our pipelines and walk the right-of-way. We walk it annually for safety purposes. We also fly the right-of-way uh, once a week depending on weather. And so we need to have visual, a visual inspection of the right-of-way itself. What what is the estimated duration of you know how long does it take to actually lay that pipeline on a particular person's property? Is that a you know is that we're talking months? Are we talking a full no, growing talking, season? What's the no? We're talking a very short period of time where the ditch is actually opened on a particular landowner. If it's a short duration, it could be done in one or two days. If it's a longer piece of property, it could be done you know over the course maybe a week at the most that a trench might be open. We go in stages where we clear first. Then we open the trench, we weld the pipe, we lay it in, we close it back, and then, you know, restore after that. So it goes in a linear fashion where all the different pieces come one right after the other. We'll probably have about eight different spreads. So you're not going from north to south or south to north in one fell swoop. We probably have like a golf court, like if you're playing golf, you would have a shotgun start. This is almost like a shotgun start on a on a on on the different spreads that would be used to try to do that. And that's also to lessen the duration uh, of, of the actual construction period. Um, the other thing that happens is even though you're, the ditch may not be open for that long, you w the property might still be used for a travel lane. So let's say a particular spread in an area is maybe 10 miles long or something, and these are just examples. But a portion of that, the right-of-way is used as the access so that you're not having to access off public roads as much as possible. So we use the right-of-way or the, the temporary construction as a travel lane. So you are disrupted longer than what the ditch would actually be open. So for growing, we certainly do crop. We know that crop loss, you're going to lose that strip for that particular year. So we're going to pay, you know, 100% of crop loss there. And then we're going to negotiate about how long it would take to take the yields to come back. Hopefully with best management practices, we feel like the yields would come back in three to four years. So that's what we're going to be working with each landowner if they have crop loss on trying to get those yields back to 100%. 
Okay, and uh, we're trying to keep the the call to about thirty minutes because we know our members have to. They got to go pay the bills themselves. Um, when uh, what should our members? What should landowners expect that when when construction rolls through their county? Um, you know, what is that particular process look like? Well, we're going to have, there will be an influx of workers, absolutely, whether local or coming from other areas, they'll need, if you can think about what a whole person needs, a whole person needs a place to sleep, a place to eat, a place to buy goods, um, all of those kinds of things, uh, you're going to have uh, an influx of even just, you know, if you have, let's say you have a local hardware area, store in your area, our folks would rather buy local and go to your local hardware store than they would to go to a Home Depot that may be 20 miles away. Um, and so you're going to want to understand those kinds of um, really the types of things that people need as they are located temporarily in a location and kind of thinking about what a whole person needs uh, to sustain themselves. That's the kind of business opportunities that uh, would crop up. We are willing to come back if any of your members are interested. Once we get closer to construction and once we've chosen some construction contractors, there won't be one. There'll probably be maybe I don't know how many, but probably maybe three uh, contractors. We're happy to come back and maybe also do another call like this to talk about, again, the things that we buy local, like straw, uh, fencing, gravel, you know, some of those kinds of things, and trying to – we do have a, on our website, um, Kevin, and I know you're going to give the website, we do have a place where vendors can sign up to be a potential vendor to tell us what their company is, what their goods or services are that they sell, um, and then we will give that list of vendors, local vendors, to our contractors to use as a list to start from for things to buy locally. And so let's go over that, that website now. Uh, where can folks go online to learn more about this particular project, Cindy? Right. We have a website. It's um, AtlanticSunriseExpansion.com. Okay. Uh, you and, can uh, also We have that us. just for your... Oh, okay. and I just wanted to let the folks know, if you go to nfib.com forward slash PA, so if you go to the Pennsylvania section of the NFIB uh, Pennsylvania website, uh, we have that link there, Atlantic Sunrise Expansion. I mean, that that's, uh, that sounds pretty simple, but again, that's a lot of letters. <laughs> uh, but uh, that information and the link is also on our website. Um, and then you also have an email address. Forgive me for stepping on your uh, comment right. a moment ago. We have we have any number of things. So we, you can also email us at Atlantic Sunrise at Williams dot com. You can connect with us on Twitter at A-T-L-S-U-N Project, and we'll give all of these to Kevin. And you can follow us on Facebook, Google, um, and we have a YouTube channel as well. All right, we'll fantastic. We'll give all of those electronic connections to Kevin to put on his website. Fantastic. Cindy Ivey uh, from the Williams Company, uh, project uh, leader here with the Atlantic Sunrise Expansion uh, Pipeline Project. Thank you so much for being on the, the call with us and our members. Uh, and now also, folks, just again wanted to point out to you, if you, if you have questions that uh, we, we didn't have time for today, uh, at the end of this call, you'll be prompted. You can leave a message, uh, and leave your email, a telephone number, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, Cindy and her team or NFIB uh, get back to you with whatever your, your question is. I want to thank you again for joining us for this latest round of NFIB Teletown Hall meetings. Appreciated your feedback. Appreciated the questions. Also want to, again, thank our sponsors uh, for our member activities this year, uh, including AT&T, Capital Blue Cross, and uh, Lily Company, uh, and uh, for Kevin Shivers, uh, we'll catch you next time here for NFIB uh, with our next edition of our Teletown Hall meeting. So thank you very much.